All right. Welcome everybody to today's uh, SFI uh, uh, seminar. Uh, all of you, uh, thank you the ones who are in person here. Um, I am uh, very, uh, very proud uh, to introduce to you one of our own. Uh, Nitin Sankhev did his uh, master's degree in robotics uh, here at Penn. He continued with uh, doing his uh, uh, PhD at the University of Maryland uh, College Park. Uh, he is uh, uh, one of uh, the very few people in the world uh, who got uh, an event-based camera in a closed uh, loop with the control system. Uh, that uh, and he really produced. Uh, I mean, I would say after uh, David Caramusa's group uh, during that time, during this period of time, he produced really probably the most papers, including like uh, uh, event-based uh, robotics. Uh, and uh, he is now faculty at uh, Western Polytechnic Institute, uh, the first uh, university which uh, has uh, uh, robotics uh, masters, uh, uh, robotics undergraduate and PhD, I think, right? PhD and master, masters, yeah. Masters, uh, and uh, he is also the founding uh, editor of the new journal uh, uh, Nature Robotics. Uh, I think. Thank you. Thanks, Costas. So, yeah, this brings back memories because it's the same room I defended my thesis in. Let's go with fun. Okay. So now I want you to imagine a world wherein there are no bees. What do you think would happen? What's the most basic thing that can happen? Pollution. Okay, so what will happen because of that? Right. So we are gonna lose about half of our food. It's that bad. Right. And imagine this happens 20 years down the line. Right, we have 8 billion population today, probably going to be like 15 billion by then, right? And we lose half of our today's current food supply. That's worse, right? Like, so we are going to be on a ratio of like what 20 is to 1, 4 is to people. So basically, 1 in 20 people can be fed. That's it, that's how bad it is, right? So, people are obviously working on solving this problem of how do we conserve these. Because it's not just a simple problem, right? Like it's obviously there's global warming and all these things, but we as roboticists should also think about species, right? It's not just about pollination, right? You want to think about autonomy at scales which are not thought about that, right? If you think, okay, like the house fly can do stuff which most of us can, right? Most of us, right? Not everything, at, at least at the functional level. So the question is, how do we do that? That's that's what hopefully. My talk will give you a philosophy to at least think about how we can achieve that. Right? That's that's the eventual goal. Okay. So to answer that question, so we went back to the fundamentals, right? Instead of saying, okay, we have to reconstruct the entire scene, basically do planning and then do control. We said, okay, can we go back to the fundamentals of what this event is? Right? We need to understand what the philosophy is, right? So the first question we asked is what is perception? Perception is, is not just sensing, it's sensing plus making some sense out of that sense, sensing part, right? It's cognitively understanding what you perceive around the world in a physical space, right? That's what perception is. Then we said, okay, why do we why do we care? Why do we need perception in the first place? Why can't we all just be blind with all things that we just do ourselves, right? So the main answer to that is to perform any action, you need to react to your environment. You need to perceive it, then you need to react, right? So you need perception to act upon. Right? That's why you need that, right? And then the hottest debate in robotics is okay, which is more important, right? If you ask a vision person, the vision person will be like, oh, 50% of our brain is dedicated to perception. So obviously it's way more important. Right? It's, it's way harder, right? If you ask a controls person, the controls person will be like, oh no, of course not. Like the controls is way, way harder because without controls, like what is the use of perception, right? But as a roboticist, I would say both are equally important, right? Both are equally hard. And you need one to do the other one, right? But even today, rarely we think about both of these problems together, right? We have separate entities of, we say, planning, perception, and control, right? Even in the core courses we have, we say, okay, they have three different things. The idea is that we want to break away from that philosophy. We say, okay, all of these things are one entity, and we need to think about how do we solve the problem, right? That's, that's the goal. Okay, 
So if I show you these images, you've seen this a billion times by now, right? So you feed this into the state of the art neural network, you can take 20 billion neurons, GPT-3, whatever you like, right? And you ask, okay, what well, is this a dog or a food item, right? It's like almost 50-50, right? It's pretty bad, but you as a human being are very, very good at this, right? Obviously also you're good at this because you have more intuitive sense of what is going on. And in the real world, if you're not sure, what you would do is if it, you would go poke at the dog, right? Like you would basically touch it or do whatever, right? You're interacting with the environment, you're moving around, getting more information. Our robotic systems do not do that, right? So in essence, what our robotic systems are doing are something called passive approaches to perception, right? So passive here means that you're not moving around. There's no control in the loop. It's just a one-shot snapshot thing and you're done. You call it a day and you move on, right? But it rarely works that way, right? So now to think about if you want to like a, have a very vague graph of size versus autonomy, here autonomy is sort of defined as the number of capabilities you have in some time frame and some compute, right? Remember, I'm only talking about onboard compute and sensing. Right? Nothing is offloaded to the cloud, right? So you are obviously bigger to smaller. Robot. In general rule of thumb, is the smaller the robot, the smaller the autonomy level, right? And but what you want it to be is like this should be more of a flat line. Right? The things on the left should go up, right? And so, but the reason why we need smaller ones is because they're safer, more agile, but as of today, they're not as intelligent, right? The number of autonomy is less. Okay? On the top, you have dangerous bulky drones, but which are quotes smarter because they can do more things. So, so on the right side, passive kind of computation is okay because you have enough compute to deal with it. And you're, you're going to be totally fine because you have enough quality sensors and enough compute to deal with it, right? As you go smaller, you sort of need to compensate for the lack of sensing with something, right? That's what we call as active, right? And define what that is inside. Okay, so in this case, size does matter. You need to think about where you are in the spectrum to worry about it, right? Okay, cool. So, and this becomes even worse when we sort of bring in nature's beings into the cloud, right? And one more thing I hid from you is this autonomy is in log scale. So it's an exponential difference, right? So now if you see that, like the honeybee or the hummingbird and the sparrow, they're very vastly different in size, but capabilities are pretty similar, right? And they're still much higher than the most advanced drone we have right now, right? That's, that's the whole thing. Okay. So, but you might be wondering, okay, why smaller drones? Right? I don't need to say this at 10, but I'm just gonna say it for people who don't work in aerial robot, right? It's safer, obviously, less things to hit. It's more agile because your moment of inertia drops, right? And you can easily deploy this as forms. Right? Obviously, Kumar is the pioneer of thorn robotics, so you all know this part. Right? Okay. So then the question is okay, why 60 is here? Why not just use 60? Why why bother with onboard something if it is so much harder, right? So one is it security. Like you it is secure. If you if would you be okay with cap a drone capturing and hovering around you every single time? Probably not, right? So you you're gonna be rest assured that it's on the robot itself, right? So that's safe. And it's obviously robust to infrastructure failures where you want to deploy this in the wild. You do not want to rely on GPS or something external, right? Like you want to be readily able to like this. Right? And that's how you can deploy it in the wild. Okay, cool. Again, though my talk focuses on aerial robots, I'll just give you a side disclaimer that it's agnostic to the robot. Your slight math will change, but your philosophy will remain the same. The whole goal is to use movement to make your perception easier. Right, that philosophy will still remain the same. Okay, so second. Okay. So birds and insects are masters of flight. Birds solve the complex navigation task of flying through narrow gaps at high speed with relative ease as they've adapted their eyes to sense at high speed. But life is not that simple when you're an insect. You just do not have the good quality eyes for the computation power. You need to wander around the gap and then support towards it to get inside. Very different philosophies, right? The bird could do that in one shot because it had enough compute, but the bee is not that good. So it's moving around the gap, it's figuring out where it's supposed to go, so it's doing whatever it's supposed to do, and then from here points like that, right? So now the question becomes okay, do you think like the bird or the bee, right? So in our case, because we are trying to go as small as possible, we are thinking more towards the bee than the bird. And the goal is this is called active perception, which is you're going to use movement to make your perception easier and vice versa, right? So both of these things are coupled into this. So your planning and perception part is, is combined through the control. Right? 
right? So all three things which we talked about in robotics are just one thing. It's just one task driven system, right? That's the whole idea. Okay. So now, uh, just as a spoiler alert, so what we achieved is with this active drone design, we are somewhere there. Right? This is this is where we are at. As of 2021, this is where we are, right? So to give you perspective of with nature how this is, so we have about a billion artificial neurons, which is greater than that of a sparrow hawk, right? We are about the weight of a sparrow hawk. We are around the size of a hummingbird, but in capabilities, we are still lesser than that of a right? Just to give you perspective of how far we are from nature, right? Okay, so now let's compare this with the state of the art. This is one of Penn's robots, right? So this was the state of the art at that time. Right? This was the first iteration of the fast flight autonomy project, right? Okay, so in the lowest end of the spectrum, you have robots which are like flapping insects, so tiny, but they don't have any sensing or power on them, right? It's just to showcase that you can build something that's fine. Then as you go higher, you can have extremely custom hardware. So this, and you have like crazy flies and things like that. So you, you get a little more autonomy, right? Like basic, basic stuff. Then you go even fancier, you have even more custom hardware and you put a little more sensing suite, right? So, and then you get better, right? And as you go along, you get like, uh, this, these two robots are from pen, wherein you're gonna use smartphone chips to actually make them smarter, right? But now these are much bigger than your hand. Right, these are about 250 millimeters. Right? Okay, they're not that bad. And if I plot Skydio, which is a drone you can buy off the shelf today, it's way higher up there. Right? The reason it's it's up there is because of two things. One is software hardware co-design. Obviously, they have integrated everything really well. That's the engineering part. And the second part is they actually are also using active vision philosophies inside. They're doing perception aware planning, which is active vision, right? So they do that. So, and on the right side, you go with the LiDAR stuff, right? If you have a big bulky LiDAR, you can afford to put on a robot, but you are going to be much higher in the amount there. Okay. okay, over the years, this is what we have done. So over the years, we have gone down in size and we have gone up in attack, right? And how did we do that is, is this whole talk. It's what we need to be done. Okay, so instead of thinking of each robot as like perception planning and control, we said, okay, you want to think of it in tasks, right? Each agent is part of a task, right? On the bottom, we have stabilization, which is your, your need to be stable. Then you are going to segment your independently moving objects with dynamic obstacles. Then you have obstacle avoidance, right? Then you have homing, which is basically saying, how do I get back home? Instead of building a full map, we are just going to maintain a vector which points back to you. If you have a compass, it's easy. You can say northeast for 50. If you do not, then it's, it's going to be a visual compass, right? Okay, then you're gonna use all these capabilities to land. So you can go back home and land. And this is one single agent, right? And this entire thing is for pollination of color, right? But you can change this module as you And again, like I said, it's task driven, it's not a generic thing, right? And this is one agent, right? But I can do the same thing for multiple agents and do cooperative landing, like talk amongst each other. I can also bring in a few more agents and I can say, okay, I can do swarm pursuit in the world also. And I can keep building this character. Okay. So particularly active vision has to be sort of like implemented. So we have four particular ways we say, okay, are four forms of activeness, right? The first one is moving yourself. So you move around, right? Second one is you do active sensing, which is even cameras, which is what courses, courses works on a lot, right? Like some of you work on it as well. So, and then moving a part of the body, right? Moving your head, moving your eyeballs and all that kind of stuff. Right? Finally, you can also hallucinate these things, right? Nerves are a prime example of that, right? You can hallucinate things, okay. So just to give you a perspective that the robot is exactly the size of a hummingbird, that's what that photo is showing, right? Cool, okay. So activeness by body movement is basically, you have your robot, it's uh, unsure about something, it's gonna move around in the space and it's gonna get a new view of that object. That's what activeness by movement is, right? It's that simple, okay. So in the first work, I'm going to talk about how you're going to fly through gaps of unknown shape and size and location, right? With just a single camera. Okay. So the motivation behind this is imagine you're in a disaster scenario, right? And you have building with random shaped opening and you have a swarm of robots which have to go in, right? And they want to exit out of other random shaped holes, right? Step zero of all this is to find random shaped holes, right? That's the whole basic concept, right? So the way we do it is, 
Remember the B example we had before? Just like the B, we are going to move around, take multiple snapshots, then we are going to like take the optical flow between the each of those frames. We are going to combine the optical flows and to get like a detection of the gap. Right? Now remember this, there is no 3D structure here whatsoever. It's just basic optical flow and it's all 2D image processing, right? It's just simple 2D image processing we can get where the gap is without ever doing put 3D reconstruction. Okay, we do that and then to track the gap, it's hard because it's unstable and prone to drift. So instead, we track the inner part and the outside part separately. And then we infer the gap from that. Right? And then we find it by actively setting the gap. Okay. And uh, works pretty well. It works well on uh, different real world experiments of different window shapes and sizes. And obviously, it's like we can find at 2.5 meters per second about 85% accuracy. And uh, it also works very well for windows with just minimum tolerance of 9, 5, and 7 centimeters. Right? So, and to give you perspective, the robot is about uh, 34 centimeters. So 5 centimeters is tiny compared to the size of the robot. Right? Okay. We do that, and then we say, okay, this is cool. This is an RGB camera, but we cannot, that limits the speed we can fly, right? So, we say, how can we do better, right? Now we are going to take a robot, we are going to replace the eyes on the robot with something better, right? So we are going to, instead of putting an RGB camera like that, I'm going to put something called an event camera. An event camera sees only the intensity changes in light, and the blue and red represents the sign. The previous one was monocular camera. Monocular camera. RGB. RGB. So, yeah, it has, a, it has an IMU obviously on board to stabilize the tone, but yeah, okay. Right? So, that's what this is doing, right? Like you have an event camera which is going to help you fix those issues, right? Okay, so this was a collaboration with Davide's group at the University of Zurich. So what we did is, remember the gap thing is like a special case of static obstacle avoidance. Just don't run into the wall, go into the gap. This is the opposite of that problem, right? Okay. In nature, a bird's real life is very different to what you saw before. You often encounter predators or you're not so friendly neighbor trying to attack you. To solve the problem of dodging, these masters of flight have evolved to sense at high speed with low latency, even at night. Right? That's what an event camera is. So it's a silicon version of what these animals have and what we have. Right? Okay, great. So this is what dodging looks like. So you have an aerial robot which is hovering, doing its own business, and you start throwing stuff at the right? And even when it's like drifting slowly, it can still react. And at this point, we did not have the capability to be moving fast and do it because of hardware limitations, but this is, so that's why we started with the hovering. Okay. <laughs> so, and uh, again, you see a bunch of carpets there. That's for uh, getting optical flow from the down-facing event camera. And then we'll see what that is in a second. Okay. So the hardware setup looks like this. So you have a front-facing event camera, you have a down-facing event camera, uh, and everything is running on the robot itself, on the Jetson TX2, right? It's a pretty big robot. Okay, so because getting data for dodging is pretty expensive, you don't want to start throwing stuff at the drone because that's a little scary, right? So we simulate all this, right? We, we take the blender simulation engine and we simulate, right? You're simulating random shaped objects of different colors and so on, and we just generate event data, right? And we train our networks, right? But obviously there's a sim to real gap. So I'll show you how we fix that, right? So the approach is, what we do is we have, these raw event frames from the both down and the front facing cameras. We feed this into a network called EVD plus, right? So, and we basically get frames which are denoising these things, right? This is what helps us actually do some to real. What it's actually doing is instead of making the simulation images look more like real, it's going to make the real images look more like simulation. Opposite way. Doesn't matter, right? All of them we just have to do some to real at the end of the day. That's the whole idea, right? So, and this is completely self supervised. This is based on a contrast loss and a reconstruction loss, right? Super simple, right? Okay. So, without any intermediate simulation of optical flow. No, it's just basically saying that take the event image and basically give me back a version of the event image with less loss. And noise is seen as variance. So, yeah. So, that's all it's doing, right? It's basically blobifying these images, which is basically making it more like simulation. It's actually, though it's called EV deep learning, it's actually making it more bloody, but it still works. And the name should be changed. So like, uh, did you uh, compare it with the name based and it just question bloody or something? 
Yeah, we did, we did. So this works better. <laughs> because this is not doing a simple linear thing, right? It's a much more non-linear thing. And it's depending on the structure also. So in theory, you can probably handcraft it and it will work equally well. But this is just an easier thing. And this network is tiny. It is like less than one MB. It's a tiny model, right? Of course. Yeah. Event frames. These are event frames. Yeah. So you take an event data in some time frame, you just make a frame out of it and create it. This is just a representation to show you in color, but there's no color. Are there any discounts for this? What do you mean? No, no, I mean, it's just like a simple, like it should have, it should be relatively small enough window because we're moving fast. But apart from that, we were using one milliseconds in everything that was not tuned for experiment. It was a standard one millisecond fix for every single time, right? And that was also because of the hardware limitations we had, like one millisecond worked well enough. So we just kept it and we just went with it, right? Okay. And then what we do is remember the down facing camera was looking at planes. So we are going to use that in estimate tomography. This was actually adapted from one of the works here from, from Shreyas, right? So from Kumar's group, right? Which was doing homography. We just took that, we basically made an event version of that, right? We took do that. And with the homography, obviously, yeah. Was this, I don't remember, Shreyas, was it a ground supervised or a supervised? This was uh, supervised, but we also did uh, self supervised, we had the same results on the robot performance, yeah. Because we already had done the EV deep learning to do synthoreal. Made no difference for us. And so we, we tried both in the paper, we have both comparisons. So we have almost the same. So this homography you needed plus for the relative orientation to the relative position, relative position. There's no ground to here, right? So it's just to maintain overing. We were just using that. Okay. So and now because of that, you know how much you've drifted. So if you are drifting, let's say slowly, and there's an object coming in, you need to know how much you've drifted, right? Because the relative motion is basically anything you throw at you. If it's not moving like you, that's what you need to. Right? That's what this next network did for us, right? That's called EV sec flow. We call it sec flow because it gives us something called segmentation flow, which is anywhere there is no object, it gives a zero flow. So think of a segmentation mask and a flow mask and multiply them together. And we just learned that entire thing. That's why we call it segmentation, right? It's not optical flow, it's, it's a version of the optical flow. And uh, what is for vision here? For this one? Yeah. So this was completely supervised. Yeah. So this was the only self supervised one. These two were like we did supervise and unsupervised here, and this was supervised. Okay. And it still works. So masks. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, mask. yeah. so that's what we did. So we took the bottom facing camera, we got the motion information from that. We used it with the front facing frames, and we basically got the segmentation. Right. Now, from the segmentation flow, you obviously know how the objects are moving. So you write a control policy to dodge them. That's the purpose. Right. And when you do that, like you can start dodging things of any arbitrary shape, size, and location, right? And we show it on different, different like shapes of objects, like the car, the ball, and, and another drone. So it works pretty well. And the Wicon product is just there to show you it would have actually hit if it was there, right? And uh, what uh, right, that one? this one. So the entire three networks runs at about eight hertz on a two So. So we are predicting it. So we're stacking the optical flow values to get an idea of where it would hit us on the image plane, but there's no PD. So for the ball case, like it's exactly the same as Davide's paper. So Davide has a science paper, which is for spheres, right? So that is exactly the same as that paper. So if you know the size of the sphere, right? For the car, we only knew the bound and for the aeroplane, we had no idea. So like if the more information you have, the more guarantees you can give, the less information you have, you're just like best guess. I'm just gonna cross my fingers and pray it will work. Okay. It works pretty well most of the times. So sometimes it didn't work. So we got about 70% overall success rate for unknown objects, which is okay. Not, not the best, but it works pretty well. So, and what we can also do is we can take that control policy, clip a sign there, and say now go hit the thing to see how accurate it actually is. And we can actually hit it pretty pretty much every single time. We didn't want to do this many times. We only ran it ten times. We were scared of breaking the event camera. So yeah, it, it works pretty well. So it shows that it actually works, right? It, it's actually accurate enough. Okay. So then what we did is okay. We said event cameras are amazing. They have this high temporal resolution. What can we do 
more with this. So we tied up with Guido de Grun from TUDEF. And we said, okay, the fastest moving thing on a drone is a propeller. So can we not just detect propellers? Instead of detecting the drone because it's too hard, it can be camouflaged. The propellers have to show up. They are spinning. Normal camera will see a big blurry mess, right? You see on the left side here, this is what a $5,000 DSLR camera sees with 8,000th of a shutter, second shutter speed, when the motor is running at 50%, right? Which is over 40, right? This is what you're looking at. Amazing, right? So that's what we did. Said, okay, can we, again, we did the same thing in simulation. We generated propellers of various shapes and sizes. We wrote a mathematical model for that. We took it from an old fluid dynamics textbook from 3D. We converted that to a 2D projection. We wrote big math, and then we generated a bunch of propellers, and we trained the network. We took it, we put it on a coral TPU, and it works at 35 volts. Much faster. Right? Like the previous one was 8, this is 35. Right? So then what we can do is, at the bottom here, like you'll see the like propellers would be hard to see because they're spinning, but you'll see these green little dots, which are sort of like the detections. Right? So because of that, we can start following the drone. That's pretty simple. Right? The drone on the top is following the one on the bottom. It does not know how it is. Right? I mean, there's no icon used. Just to show you that it's actually working. Okay, so we do that. And we can do the same thing for even like landing on another port. So the detections are a little worse here because of the contrast reduction, but still works accurate enough. Okay. So these are like all closed loop, everything running on the robot, like there's no external information. The only extra thing we have is that we have a kill switch outside, but apart from that, nothing else. Okay. So now, remember, I told you that there is activeness in two parts. We did like we change the sensor, we did that thing, but okay, what if uh, neither of them are good? Okay, you're a small agent, so neither of them are developed enough. So, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to follow this outlet's philosophy. So the reason outlets are doing that is they actually are doing this for both vision and sound because their their ears are not fully developed yet, so they're not asymmetric yet for them to localize sound. So they're moving around their head to for the lack of that ability, and also because their eyeballs do not. So they do that at that young age. As they get older, they won't do that again, right? Super important, right? In the life of one agent, there's so much difference. That's what that's what we said. Okay, your vision has to be. And we do this all the time, right? If I cannot see what is behind Carl's laptop, I do this, right? I don't have to move around, I just move my neck, right? That's, that's what this is. Right? Okay, so we took that idea, we said, okay, can we just do that, right? You have a stereo camera set up, and you have some fixed baseline, which is the distance between the two cameras, right? And when you're too near or too far, you basically will not get any data, right? Which is simple to understand. When it's too far, you don't have enough resolution to distinguish. When it's too close, like you don't have common features at all, right? So that's that's bad. So if you want to like write a little bit of math, I promise is the only there are only two equations in the entire talk. This is one of them, right? Actually, there are more, but so this basically is the error in depth, and this is your baseline, right? You see that they are related to each other, right? But you can also see that like to reduce this, you can start changing this B. That's what we said we do, right? So what we did is we put our uh, stereo camera, there are two things on linear servo motors, we move them around, right? Now, we remember there's a problem to calibrate the sunlight. So, we actually used your one of your papers, this is your hand eye calibration paper with real cotton. So we use that paper, we calibrate this on the time every single time, right? We calibrate it on finite number of points for forward kinematics, and anytime we see that there's something wrong, we recalibrate it on the fly, right? Okay, so we once we do that, we can actually use that to fly through a forest. Right? So on the bottom, you'll see that this is a color map of like a jet color map of baselines. This is changing baseline. You can also observe that in the video here that these two cameras are actually moving around. Right? This runs about one to one point five hertz on the robot. It's pretty slow, but because it's seeing depth, it can actually plan for much further. Right? So that's that's why it works. So, and as you see going, this going along, like it's only going towards a goal direction, the goal direction is getting used. It does not have a goal location, it's just going towards that direction. As it goes there, it knows where to stop it. Just, right? Okay. So, 
Yeah, it's like uh, this is running at around five hertz, uh, five uh, meters per second. So it doesn't look like it because I'm running around and it's, it's a stabilized video, but it's actually pretty fast. Is the motor there that moves the yeah, there's a servo motor which moves it like left and right. And what are the camera scale? This is a standard uh, GB that's camera. Yeah. There's no event. Camera. And what there is running? Uh it's running the standard SGBM. The oldest version. Yeah. yeah, the old one. We tried with the neural network also. The, the, that was too heavy for this part. So this was just doing a Raspberry Pi. A very simple computer, like nothing too fancy about it. That's why I said it's slow. With the TX2, that can run at about 30 minutes. Same thing, right? So, yeah, well, pretty well. And all we were doing is we were changing the baseline in proportion to the closest distance. This is where action and perception sort of merged, right? You have a controller for the perception loop as well, which is very weird when you think about it, right? Okay, so obviously, we can do the same thing for like dynamic gaps. So, as uh, two brave Students who are inside the net, uh, please do not do this. So, yeah, that's fun. So, we were doing that. And let's put this one. It's pretty good. So, same thing, right? So, baseline is going to change in proportion to the median distance to the camera. It could take me, but we took median for the first time, right? Okay. Now, your robot is old. Remember the old example I told you? It's, it's getting older and wiser. It's seen a lot of things in its life, right? It's gone through a lot of experiences. Now, it's remembering things, right? Remembering. As an app is just basically hallucination, right? You're recalling something and you're imagining what it would be, right? So if I showed you this image and asked you, okay, what is important in this? What would your answer be? Just that question. I have not told you what this image is of. I have not even going to ask you what this image is. I just asking you what is important. Here. What would your answer be? Yeah. Or what are the important things? That's not be one thing. Yeah, right. So, and I can now start plotting. I can get the answer from you. I can get the answer from Costa. I can start getting the answer from each one of you and plot that, right? But that's slow. Instead, what I'll do is I'll put eye tracking goggles on you and just see how long your eye gaze rests on each part of the image, right? And do a heat map of that. This is what you're saying, right? That's what it looks like. This is called visual saliency, right? Saliency because it's salient, visual because it's based on your eye tracking, right? Once you get this, we were like, oh, this is super cool. We never looked at the walls, but why is our slam system looking at the walls? So that's what we're going to use now to fix our all broken slam system, right? So that's what we did. We say, okay, we took direct sparse odometry, which was a state of the art direct method at that time. But then we just changed the feature pipeline to use saliency like we do. We did, would it work better? That was the question here. Okay. So we took the thing, we passed it through something called SALGAN, a saliency GAN. We get our saliency map. The problem with the saliency map is depending on the viewpoint, this blob would move around a lot. It was pretty fuzzy. So we combined it with higher level semantics of sleep passing. We combined both to get like a better saliency map, which is like object level saliency map, right? This was inspired by your work where you would like with the uh, shot. So where you are actually identifying objects, we don't identify objects here. We take one step back. We say, okay, we can just make do the same thing with saliency, right? So we did that. And then with uniform sampling, you see that features are everywhere. This is what DSO uses. With saliency, it's much better already. And with scene passing, you almost remove everything which is not good. Right? This is much more stable. Right? And you might be wondering, yeah. How is that? Uh, just based on visual eye tracking goggles. So you just have a data set called Salicon. Oh yeah, it's super. So it's that Salgan is not our work. Salgan is an existing thing. We just took Salgan and just same with PSP. Ego motion, yeah. Yep. So eye tracking basically you triangulate your eye tracking and do a heat path. That's what's right? So that's that's what we do, right? Cool. So then just to show you that it works, I'm going to play a video after this. So what we did here is this is a loop, and we basically started here, we did a loop, right? I'm not going to promise you that this does loop closure. What I want to show you is drift, right? Look at the checkerboard, and these two planes are actually the same plane. There is some significant drift, right? In our case, it's all 
But notice that the features are not exactly as sharp as this because they're using saliency, which is fuzzy. But it's still overall more accurate. Right? Okay. It's a great idea. Why do you use That was the state of the art at that time, on, on benchmarks at least. We could have taken any method, and I'll show you why, why we chose that because we chose the numbers on this. Right? So DSO had scale drifts. Then basically, say in DSO fixes that. And DSO also had a lot of optimization features. The moment you see a plain white wall, it will just go crazy. Then there was a simple object. If there were more white walls than the plain object, it would go crazy. Right? So that is what we fixed. Okay. And this is that in action. And we are 83% better than DSO, which was a state of the art at that time. We held the state of the art for four years after that until the deep learning methods came along. Okay. So we were 340% better than SVO2 at that time. And we were 770% better than our summer. Of course, with look closure and all. Because remember, this is automated. There's no look closure. So it's still much, much better. So is the reason there that the fact that you were removing those features that were going to be outliers yep. in the yep. sense? Of yep. You're, you're basically removing things which are not good, which you would hope that Ransack would. But Ransack, it would still comply with the epicolor constraints, though, right? Like Ransack would not remove that because it's not scaling. That's, that's yeah. what he's saying. And is there any correlation to um, feature density and then the saliency that we've looked at? What do you mean by that? Um, so, like you said, when I'm looking for a white wall, I'm looking for a detection area, mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. uh, have you just looked at like what in general features or like uh, what's interesting about these areas we're looking at? Oh, yeah. So, we did to... we did have a look at that. So, ops are one that not ops. So, DSO basically said that it has to be uniform towards matter. And we said that makes no sense. We went the exact opposite route, and it actually did perform much better. And their their claim was that as long as features are uniformly distributed, it actually works better. We were like, no, that makes sense because if you have bad features and though it's distributed evenly, it will not work. There's implicit bias towards bad things. That's what we were trying to show. Okay. So then, obviously, we took all of these ideas. We made the world's first prototype of the Robo Beehive. And uh, this drone was about as big as a hummingbird, but like a real hummingbird. It could fit in the palm of your hand. Um, oh, pretty well. So I won the Larry Davis thesis, best thesis award, and won the NDPA drones award. Right? So this was also featured in a BBC Nature documentary, which is going to be coming out next month. Right? So that just happened like last week. That's going to be OK. So we were also featured on the Instagram page. Okay, so I'm going to just play a very quick edited version of the video, which is not BBC. And this is what we quickly just made something up. And so we have the thing on the back is the hive drone, which is going to carry all these little bee drones. Right? So that thing on the back is huge, the one meter long. Right? The thing is this. And this weighs less than a red book cam, which is give you an idea of how light it is. Right? So, and like the first thing step is we deploy the low ones from the first beehive drone, which is it falls and catches itself in air and stabilizes itself, right? Then it finds a flower, it's gonna like go back on that flower, it's spread up there six times. Again, like I said, it's a very crappy video, but it does the job, right? It's gonna touch on that flower, it has velcro on the bottom to sort of mimic that it's taking the photo from it. And then there's gonna be a bird which is gonna come on the right. <laughs> <laughs> try to try to attack the smaller robot, but it's not going to be successful. It's the bee's day today. So then it's going to be like, okay, bye bye. Okay. And it's going to go continue doing its business. I'm calling it the next problem. Okay. That's it. So, what sensors are going to be there? So, it basically has a front facing time of flight sensor, uh, it has a down facing two cameras. One for optical flow, just a pure optical flow sensor, and it has one for color. And everything is running on the microcontroller. That's the cool trick. So we use Fine EML to run all the networks on the OpenMV cam, and everything else is running on the it's on microcontroller, just 480 megahertz. So that's uh, sorry. Power landing space integration. So yes, so very simple. It's blob tracking plus divergence. So blob tracking is used as a proxy to get global flow. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's that's it. It's that simple. We fuse that with the angle return for the people who are familiar with it. Right? Okay. So but wait, not done yet. So I only talked about Activision today. Right? Okay. So 
remember this is what I showed, right? So what we want to do is now remember this chart. If you're still very far away, right? The question we asked was, what do we need to get there, right? Like after this, this is after my PhD. Right? That's why that's why that break is there. Okay. So after my PhD, I said, okay, there has to be one equation which sort of governs all of these things, or else what is the point, right? So flying through gaps, dodging dynamic obstacles, and flying through forest with moving baseline. What is the one common? Like from a perceptual point of view. This, this is what this was my question to my advisor. Like there should be something which makes no sense that that is the same thing. Okay? I said they all use some representation of motion field. There should be some one equation which governs some thing between all of them, right? And we call this our perception for lack of a better word, right? Because we don't have a word for that. And so we can use this idea to unify all these problems together. Okay. So what that is, I'll show you in a second. Right. So they call optical flow. This I stole from Costas' slides. These equations now. So I'm going to play this video. Imagine you have taken any two frames in that video, right? The first and the last frame, and you can compute optical flow. Right. All of you know what optical flow is, right? It's the pixel movement between the two things. Okay. okay. So now I can plot that as a color wheel here, and it's basically the vector direction and the magnitude at the same time, right? The darker the color, the the more the magnitude, and the angle, the hue is the angle, right? All you need you need to remember is the closer the color in the hue wheel, the closer it is in real life motion. Right? Okay, so the optical flow equation looks like that. Right? What that is, we will talk about. Right? So optical flow p dot depends on two things, and this the first part depends on structure, second part depends on orientation. Right? So the thing is, p dot assumes that the image you are trying to match between two frames to compute this is existent in both frames, which is you can see the point. Right? But that thing is not always valid. Let's take this boundary case, for example, right? Imagine this is the object boundary. You take one pixel inside and one pixel outside. Okay? What could happen is if I zoom into this and I do particular camera motion, so this is going to be ill-conditioned at these edges, simply because you can have occlusions because your camera moved that way, or you could have an occlusion which showed a new part which is not there before, right? So now the points do not exist in both the frames you are seeing, right? That's the problem. Okay, so these accretions and deletions are due to occlusions, which will make the P dot indefined, right? So now let's define a quantity called epsilon, right? So it's sort of related to uncertainty. So it's like this logic, think about it, it's the green little for uncertainty, right? So I'm just gonna tell you, okay, I'm gonna predict optical flow and I have some magical ground for optical flow if it was in situation. And I just want to learn this quantity where I'm unsure. So what is has it when it came? So so the red thing is basically what I'm predicting, blue thing is what is grounded. If it existed, I wanted some some function epsilon which is related to that inner point. So if it's a so in simulation, it technically knows right where that pixel is. So from the motion field, you can project it back. Right? That's what I'm saying. This physically doesn't exist. Yeah, yeah. So that's what I'm saying. Let let this exist. Okay. So now all I'm trying to say, get to the point here is epsilon is high at object boundaries, right? The error is going to be high. Just very intuitive when you think about it, right? That's that's all I'm saying. But that is very powerful. Why is that powerful? Because that ended up getting us a science robotic thing, right? Apart from that, so the whole idea was with that equation, which I'm going to show you next. What we did is we can unify all these problems with just uncertainty. Right? So what we estimated is something called general heteroscedastic aleatoric uncertainty. I'll break that down in a second. So heteroscedastic just means that your variance varies with the input. Right? It's dependent, right? Obviously, I said it depends on the boundaries, and that is dependent on the input, right? So that is what heteroscedastic. Right? Aleatoric is that it's something inherent to do with the sensor itself. Right? So for cameras, cameras cannot see through objects. So you're inherently uncertain at the object boundaries, right? And especially when motion is involved because of the okay? okay. So all we did is we have this little function. You can take any loss function f and hit it with this h and g. And you can convert any any neural network, which you are, you are going to train, supervised or unsupervised, doesn't matter. You can convert it into this form, right? 
All it's doing is F is an error metric, which are going to be supervised around this, right? G is a positive monotonic function, H is a negative monotonic function, and lambda is a positive Lagrange metric. Right? That's it. If you can do this, and depending on specific values of G and H and F, you can have distributions from that. I'll show you one simple example. So, right? what is the Y here? And what is Y? The, y is also the, the direction. Uh, Epsilon is basically uncertainty dimension. It's uncertainty of some distributions, which I have not told you what that is. It depends on what you're choosing for AF, H, and G, what the distribution will look like. So for specific things, it will turn out to be different. The aleatoric uncertainty is uh, out. Uh, right. This is out from a network also. This is just the loss function. So like you're predicting uh -huh. Epsilon, you're predicting the blue thing, sorry, the red thing, and the blue thing in this case is the is the supervised loss, but this could be completely self supervised. Okay, you can be self supervised, yeah. And uh, uh, or you have a way, a way, a exactly based way. Yep. Of the self supervised like reconstruction. Exactly. Plus an independent uncertainty. Yep. It's a penalization on that term. Yeah, and the the second part is a penalization on all giving all high uncertainty or all low uncertainty. Like in the when you take the log of the exactly. Gaussian, the second part exactly. is the sequence. Exactly. Right? So all I'm trying to do here is F makes you predict the correct things, right? And G penalizes for I epsilon, not sigma, right? And H acts as a loss of inverted. So it's balancing these two things. It's about how how much do I trust this epsilon versus how much do I trust the loss? That's what it's balancing. Okay, and you start plugging in these values to these things, and you'll get all the papers in the literature. Right? Every single one of them. You're not found one which does not comply with this equation. Okay, so we did that, works very well. And if you plug in these specific values, you'll get the Gaussian, and with these values, you'll get the Lagrangian. But often, like uh, probabilistic papers are the same. Yes. The is, uh, They're not. Uh, uh, They're not. Right. Yep, they won't. So what you can do is you can take any network existing, you can append two channels at the output and just fine tune that. And this works. For a network, but not for are these all uh, these are all networks. Are all uh, process. Yep, these are all Bayesian neural networks. Yeah. I'll send you the paper, don't worry. There's there's more like here we have nine, we have like eight in the paper. So okay. I'll, I'll send it to you. So that's that's what we have, right? Okay, good. So now we can put this on the robot and why. Uh, that's a great question so aleatoric gives us like properties of the sensor right epistemic gives us the property of the data set so in our case we are of we, the model of the model, model yeah, yeah. data set yeah. yeah so here we were more worried about the boundaries which are implicit to the sensor itself if we had a sensor which would see through objects like x-ray this would not work okay. So that's that's the only reason, right? And also the other engineering reason is at that time aleatoric was faster. So like today we have epistemic which actually works as fast as aleatoric, right? It's added. It's added. It's added a lot. Yeah. No. Ideally, you would want to use both. You would want to use epistemic to know when not to use networks at all, right? This is just saying okay, it, like you don't even have to predict full optical flow to do stuff. It just get pipe out the uncertainty in the middle of the network itself. And that's much shallower. Okay. So we put this on a drone, works at about again 10 hertz on a TX2, a similar network to what you saw in EV Dodge Net, right? It's the same architecture again. Works pretty well. So again, we can dodge dynamic obstacles. We're going to go same stuff, channel is doing stuff at the drone now. And it pops up as a high uncertainty because of motion blur. Okay. And that's the trick we use. And it works pretty well for the same set of objects. And you can use the same thing to fly through like an indoor simulated forest, where when you get close to an object, you get high uncertainty because there's more blur and like there's a lot of motion. Okay. And that works. And here was a uh, motion segmentation or flow? Uh, was the original flow. dodge? Was the original dodge? The original dodging flow? was segmentation. Yeah. So, yeah, and the same thing works with gap flight because of you have, uh, you're going to block the part inside. When you move around, same thing happens. Okay. okay, it works. And we also had results on segmentation of objects, which I did not put here, but that's also better. Yeah. Okay. So again, going completely zooming out, remember I started the story with saying robots are embodied agents. 
I never showed you that embodiment yet. That's what is going on, right? So that was still my PhD. I said, okay, I'm done. I need to move on, right? So this is the next part. So agents do use multiple sensors. They never have one sensor, right? They can never have just one single eye on an on an on a real insect, right? They have multiple things. So what we did is we said, okay, can we couple this with an eye? Right? So Kostas teaches this to us all the time in class that we all use time to contact. When you're driving on the freeway, you do not know how far the car to you is. But you know instinctively how not to do it. You know how to brake, right? But you don't think that, oh, it's like 20 meters away. I'm driving at 60 miles an hour, so that's like half a second. You don't do all that. You implicitly brake, right? So you're estimating something called as time to contact, which is how long will I go with this speed before I hit that, right? And so we said, okay, can we use IMU and camera to get that very accurate? Right? So what we did is we got this inspiration from how humans gaze at things when they're talking about. Remember, I was telling you about eye tracking orders for saliency. This is what it looks like, right? You are gazing on different parts of the scene and you're fixating. You're looking at that for a specific amount of time, then you move on to the next thing. You're like doing the search pattern, right? And this is what we are doing at the end of the day. And the way we are doing it is we are estimating distance by two. Okay. okay, so the way what we did is we took tau, which is a time to contact, and instead of just being defined in the camera C direction, we define it in all three directions. So we generalize it into an R3 vector. Take that inverse, we call that frequency of contact. We just we just term that. So the actual tools is that just because of the spinning term protein system, we usually let it not see. Yeah, it's it's just a vector, yeah, yeah. This thing. Yep. But in the classic literature, they say it in terms of camera Z, right? Like in the spherical literature, yeah. That's in, the, in, the, in the biological literature, see on the correct. Correct. Right. Yeah, yeah. So that's what you're saying. We just have that thing as time to contact, which is for all three directions. So X velocity, Y velocity, and Z velocity. So it's for all, right? So then we come up with this constraint called the tau constraint, which is time to contact constraint, right? We are going to relate three quantities, the acceleration of your object. So you can get that from your accelerometer. And I'll show you a trick that when you do not have an accelerometer, how you will do it, right? Uh, you have your uh, frequency of contact and you have depth. And F you can replace with one by two, right? So you can also come up with, we also came up with a more robust variant of the same constraint called the phi constraint, right? Which is slightly more robust, so it works better. It's similar mathematical quantities, just more mathematical tricks to make it better. So what we are essentially doing is we have a patch in the scene we are tracking. It's a planar patch. So it could be that painting on the wall. You just pick that and you're going to track it with the KLG tracker. Okay? So you have your IMU. You're going to fuse all these things. In, use that constraint in the middle. Okay? You're done. You have your visual inertia fusion. Okay? okay. So essentially, this is what it looks like. Right? You have this patch. You're going to see this patch move around as we move around by warping using a fine board. Right? This is your focus canal. And we are estimating our x, y, and z from the right. And this works at about 580 inches a second on a single thread. And I said, okay. the coolest part, it's in Python. This is not in C++ on the next one. So you can imagine how fast that would be in Python. Uh, it's it's like two milliseconds processing time. 1.7. 1.7. 1.7. 1.78. So it's very fast, and it's open source, so you can download this code on it on your laptop. Cool, great. So now we compare it with other other methods. Like you would have heard of Linz Mono and the Movio, the state of the art BIO methods, and we are way better. Right, and we are twenty five times faster than that. Right, so we do that, and but we are, compare on the trajectory of full odometry. Full odometry. We are just doing direct, and we are still more accurate. Yeah, and we are still more accurate than this will be a slide. I don't you can run the code. <laughs> so it's to show how powerful math is. And that's the whole goal of this. And the pass tracker, you can throw out the pass tracker, which is KLT, and you can put a deep learning network that you want to kill. Okay, great. So now what we did is we wanted to use this for control of robots. So in this case, you have the same flower from the behind demo, and you have a little car. Which is basically, I'm saying, go maintain one unit away from this. It's like a visual going task, right? Okay. So remember that I told you we might not have IMU. This car did not have an IMU. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to use our control effort. 
Like how much did I command it to move as a proxy to A? Right? Okay. This is called an efference copy in neuroscience. This is how we are implicitly, if I ask you, what steps do you have to take to walk to the door? You hallucinated something. That's an efference copy. That's what the efference copy is. Right? Okay. So we are going to do that. I'm going to show you this video in a second. So now we command it with measured acceleration, which is the, the best thing, right? B here is just the game. Imagine you're tuning your PID controller with KP as well, right? And it's going to do that with reference copy again. It, it lost it a little bit, but it will converge, right? Now I'm going to bump up the gain to two, and you'll see what happens to the acceleration. This is completely metric units, right? And it's going to actually run into the thing itself. So it's that sensitive to this game. That's pretty bad. That's pretty scary. If there was a knife on that, like I would not be on that other end. That's that's not good. Okay. But with a reference copy, it will convert, but you'll be to two units, like two times the distance away. Remember, it's one unit. Here unit is arbitrary. And it's all related to it. Okay, that works. And if you plot that, you would see that in the spikes on the top. Thing on the bottom is ours. With reference copies, thing on the top is the same thing control the measure right? So this works better. Okay. okay. So the second cheat code is we are going to cheat from what a genetic evolution is doing, right? So these are two eyes of a frog, right? They obviously have differentiated pupil. One has a vertical one, one has a horizontal one. Why do you think that is? They're both frogs. They're the same species of animals, but their eyes are very different. Why do you think that is? Exactly, right? So the one on the left is a predator. The one on the right is, is a herbivore. So with the predator, you want to have a razor sharp focus on what you're tracking. So that's good. The one on the right wants a wide field. Same sensor, just the way this is. Right? So you do that. So we said, okay, can we take that and put it on an event camera? What will happen? Let's see. Right? Today, in all event cameras, you have some circular aperture with different openings. Right? That's what you tweak the aperture wheel on your system. Okay. I have a yellow box, which is the closed tree, and the black box which is the farther tree. And you get pretty pretty much like solid events on both of them, right? If they're moving. In this case, they're moving towards the tree. So what if we change that with the vertical aperture? So you see that you only get the vertical things, right? So this is sort of like semantic segmentation, right? So you only are getting the things. It's semantic in the sense that you know that you have no forest and you don't know that trees are vertical. That's the implicit implication of this to design the aperture, right? I can do the same thing with the horizontal aperture and I only get the closest. If you just don't want to hit stuff, thing on the right is not. If you want to plan ahead, thing on the left is not. And it's about you pick and choose what you want, right? And what we are working on right now is to see how we can automatically get this. Right? Like this obviously works pretty well. So we are writing up a paper for nature right now to show that this makes sense and this is by its part. And but we are trying to get this completely automatic. Given a task, how can we get this fully out? Right? Okay. And this is absolutely right. Cool. That works. And uh, going back to the plot from before, right? This is where the Beehive demo was 2022. This is where it came. So in 23, we are going to be up there. We are building custom chips to get there. It's going to be done soon. Okay. Slightly up, but it's still a long way. And remember log scale. Okay. That's fine. Okay. So to conclude, we talked about agents being embodied things. So we had a stack of things from the tasks and we had four different ways of doing active perception. We showed how this can be used for pollinating flowers, just demo of the flowers. And then we used information from camera and I knew to get time to contact, right? And I also showed you, okay, how can we think about approaches in a completely different way, okay? Okay, and uh, you can find more information in all of these papers here, right? Um, you don't have to write it down. So it's going to be there. Okay. So I'd like to thank all of the sponsors who have funded this work over the last six years. And uh, thanks to all my authors. Long list of authors, right? It's not my work. It's all their work. So, and uh, for people who are in the academic market, WPI is hiring. So the deadline is tomorrow. Right? Uh, you can email us for so trying to get an extension. <laughs> So email us. Uh, we are trying to get about two to three positions in perception, planning, and robotics in general. So any of those things, fine. Right? So we would like to work with you. We are very close to Boston. 
So we are in the hub, right? So a lot of universities there, so it's fun. Okay. And uh, yeah, I'm gonna steal some of course those students now. So if you if you're a master student who wants to do a PhD, if Costas doesn't want you, come to me. <laughs> so or if you like any of the body so, but yeah, if you like aerial robots, come work with me. We'll we'll make this robot go smaller and higher, and that's the that's the nature. Right? And the deadline for PhD applications is December fifteenth. So do apply. You can send me an email. My email is up there. And all the codes for every single talk, every single thing which I talked about today, is open source. So you can download and run them. And if you have issues, you can email. I hope you get the code. So yeah, and that QR code will take you to my website. So yep, thanks. David, David. It was a wonderful talk. Thank you, Justice. We will get the question. Uh, we don't have any questions. Thanks for any other questions. So like uh, in the gap play approach. So uh, does it matter where you initialize the tone from like do you initiate from the center or like have you done implicit? It doesn't matter. So what we did is so the only assumption we made explicitly in the paper is that you have a wide enough field of view to see the gap in the beginning. That's it. Is the first measure would be to center the group yep. to like the no, so it just basically just does an exploratory motion. So if in the image it's on the bottom left, mm -hmm. it's gonna center itself there. Mm -hmm. Then it's gonna yeah, then it's gonna yep. but it won't uh, do a common before it it can do both. It can do both. We had both control policies, both of them worked. And it's like this one is safer than just start going in because you don't know how far it was. Yep. Yep. Yeah, that's a good question. We did that. We have it in the supplementary method. Yep. In the tetraconic or or like Which one, the DTC list? Yeah, yeah. No, it is just little integration. Like there is nothing crazy. It remember that it has a Loemberger observer in, in the thing itself, which is like a basic common filter. It it already has it when it's estimated. But apart from that, no extra thing. So yeah, it's like a fancy low pass filter. So yeah, that's a you're surprised how well it worked. It's like, okay, this is cool. I'm very surprised because uh, one of, uh, in order to, to estimate uh, good geometry, uh, you have some, to have some good uh, depth. Yep. You have to have some good depth, you need bigger baseline. Yep. You don't get from the two to six. That's the yep. And the coolest thing for us, which we found, which is counterintuitive, is the more acceleration you have, the better it works, which is where traditional approaches well, become worse. Acceleration covers the baseline. Yep. That I really yep. Do. So that's what we were observing. So when you do violent motions, it works much better. So if you yeah, saw that video, it was like the other approaches have also a lot more engineering. Like oh yeah. Keyframes. Oh yeah. Uh, this one, like if you just take the code, download, and run it on the sequences we have, we have ten sequences. It will work out of box. And if you want to record your own sequence, you just need an integer real sense because it's hardware sync time in camera. It will work. And we recorded that at ninety hertz. So the faster you can record, the better it will work. So the next step is to do that in camera. Rovio performed pretty well. Yeah, yeah, Rovio worked pretty well. Like it was much better than Vince, but not as good for extreme accelerations like that. Which Vince was? Vince Mono, uh, the Shaoji's. Yeah. 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 So, the About this one, right? Yeah. So in this, you're saying like, if you knew how much you moved, would you be able to estimate epsilon for the newer one? Yeah. That's a good question. So we actually thought about that question and we gave up. So the answer is yes and no. So yes, because it's a strong prior. No, because you don't know what other things have been uncovered or are occluded. Because that depends on the structure. That depends on your movement. Now. That's what makes it hard. So if you fuse multiple of these measurements, you're much more accurate. We did try that, but we found that for the boundaries anyway, it didn't matter because it was so high. 
that we just didn't need that. So our control policies actually did not need that. But yes, it will look sharp with that. Yeah, the answer is yeah, it's a little more complicated than that. It's a good question. Yeah. Yeah, we were surprised that uh, nobody asked us that question. Okay, that's okay. <laughs> so yeah, any other questions? Hey, I have a question on Zoom. Yeah. Really quick. Hey, uh, so first off, this is great work. Um, so I, the, I have a two-part question. Yeah. Uh, first is, uh, can you comment on the uh, low light performance of the hardware and algorithms? Yeah, sure. Which uh, which work on the overall thing? Yeah, uh, especially so, the tracking. Yeah. So the the TTC disc works on a normal classical camera. So any any camera which works in low light, it works well because it's using right now a KRT tracker. So there's no innovation in the tracker itself. The other event camera stuff, like with the homography net, they work well in low light. We did test it with the low light. We have an experiment in the paper as well. So here low light was, I think, uh, let me try to remember. I think it was 10 lux or something. Okay. Yeah, so it was pretty, pretty low. It's like having like one little LED bulb on the corner of a room for a big, big large room. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, the second is uh, so typically flowers are found in close proximity to branches and leaves, which are you know pretty difficult to perceive. Mm -hmm. uh, have you investigated any collision resistant flight or sustaining collisions, detecting collisions, anything? Yeah, that's a great question. No, we have not done that yet. So we had that question. Remember, again, all this was in a very lab setting. So like to take it into the wild, it's still a very, very hard problem, right? So I remember like you had one of those works where you had like a cage which would which would be collision tolerant, right? And I think like that is kind of the way to go forward. As well. so, um, there was an, uh, some, some other stuff that we did, uh, which we very basically created a map using only collisions using a completely blind robot. Right. So I was wondering if you've done something similar uh, to detect um, obstacles in flight. Yeah, we did think about it, but no, we have not explicitly done that. Like I remember reading your paper, I'm like, yeah, this is so cool. We should integrate that, and that never happened. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, to be honest with you, that that's the honest answer. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Over Zoom, maybe. Screen yeah. Photo. Yeah. Put the robot behind. Sure. Yeah. Can you take one for my phone as well? Sure. Can end the meeting. Yeah, we can end the meeting. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Thank you, everybody.